Welcome to the 19th annual California Free Thought Day. My name is Coven Synopathy, and I'm delighted that you're all here with me today, virtually that is. I'd much rather be with you live on the steps of the California State Capitol building like we've done in years past. But a pandemic isn't going to stop us from hosting a great event this year. This year's program, though much shorter than usual, still has an excellent lineup as we focus on the secular voter, voter engagement, and the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. We'll start with recognition for Representative Zoe Lofgren of California District 19 for her legislative work and participation in the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. Then we'll hear from Sean Omar Rivera, a grassroots political organizer. After that, our authors and podcasters panel with words from Seth Andrews, Thomas Westbrook, and Aaron Lewis. Speaking of authors, we have two high school students to present, and you'll hear their winning essays. And then, a video from political scientist Juem Navarro Rivera. We're also going to recognize the volunteer efforts of local organizers Arlene Rios and Evan Clark. Throughout our video, we'll feature two exclusive performances from Australian singer-songwriter Shelley Seagal. And in closing, members of our planning committee will reveal this year's Free Thought inductees. I also want to thank all of our sponsors, donors, and all of you for tuning in and sharing this with your friends on social media. In fact, can you do that right now? Take just a second to start a viewing party or hit share or do whatever you can to help spread our enthusiasm. Enthusiasm for civic engagement, for science, for the separation of church and state, for social justice, and freedom of speech and thought. And if you tweet or use Instagram, use hashtag FreeThoughtDay. And take a selfie because tomorrow, October 12th, is Free Thought Day, a day we celebrate as atheists, as humanists, and as people who share the belief that religion and superstition have no place in our courts and laws. Okay, I'm too excited to wait any longer, so let's get to it. Please join me in welcoming the president of California Free Thought Day, David Diskin. Kevin, thank you so much for being here and kicking off this year's California Free Thought Day. I too wish we could all be together today. As you can see, we're out here on the steps of the California State Capitol Building, where normally we'd have community groups, nonprofit organizations, authors and exhibitors, families and dogs in the grass, Uncle Sam juggling and entertaining kids, all under the shade of these beautiful trees. But nonetheless, our program is still outstanding. For the next hour or so, we've got the upcoming election and civic engagement in mind. As Kevin said, this year marks the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. Voter rights have been challenged and diminished at every level of leadership in every state, and we must be vigilant in protecting our democracy. We need to encourage voter registration and participation in the electoral process. That doesn't just mean voting. It means supporting the candidates and causes that share our values through volunteering and donations. And it means, dare I say it, running for office. We want to inspire a new generation of elected officials who will draft laws and policy with respect to our country's secular foundation. Are you registered to vote? Well, if not, hit pause right now and visit freethoughtday.org. Click on the links to either register to vote or check your voter registration. I hope you enjoy this year's video event and I encourage you to share it and support us. It's not too late to get some of the gifts we've set aside for donors at the $25 and $75 levels. And every dollar will help us make next year our 20th Free Thought Day even better. Now, speaking of donors and sponsors, let's show them some love before I pass the virtual mic back to Kevin. Life can be hard. Things can get rough. Stay on. Your Applied path. Office provides on site and online Microsoft Office training for you and your employees. Big thanks also to Robert Nicholson and Ken Nahigian. 
The Reason Center is socially distancing. Check them out on Meetup for online discussions, games, and building a community in Sacramento. And the Black Humanists and Non-Believers of Sacramento can also be found on Meetup and would love to have you at their next event. Black Non-Believers is a nationwide organization that provides secular fellowship to blacks and allies walking by sight, not faith. The Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers provides a community for active duty and veteran atheists, humanists, and other non-theists in the military. Next weekend, be sure to catch the co-founder of the Satanic Temple, Lucian Graves, during Sunday Assembly East Bay's live streaming event on October 18. Learn more on their meetup page. For the unchurched Sacramento area citizens, Atheists and Other Freethinkers is a freethought oasis, a comfort zone, and a community of mind. The Humanist Association of the Greater Sacramento Area is the Sacramento chapter of the American Humanist Association. Thank you, David and our sponsors. Now, for the past few years, we've recognized California's elected officials who have shown their adherence to the same core values as California Free Thought Day. Past recipients have included California Senator Richard Pan, Congressman Jerry McNerney, and Congressman Jared Huffman. This year, we're proud to present the award to Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren. A member of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, Zoe represents Santa Clara County, including San Jose and the Silicon Valley. While serving on the House Judiciary Committee, the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee, and the Committee on House Administration, Zoe has championed immigration reform, including the 2010 DREAM Act. She's also known for her work on patent reform, copyright issues, digital rights, transgender rights, and the support of net neutrality. Accepting the award from her office in Washington, DC, here's Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren. Thanks very much for honoring me during a California Free Thought Day. I appreciate the work you're doing to draw attention to the importance of free speech, free thought, civic engagement, science, social justice, and the separation of church and state as required by our constitution. And your 2020 voter participation theme is of particular interest to me as chair of the Committee on House Administration, which has uh, primary jurisdiction over uh, federal elections. This year, Americans will cast their votes in the middle of a deadly pandemic that has claimed more than 200,000 lives across the United States. There's misinformation everywhere, recent efforts to slow the Postal Service. Many people are telling me they're concerned about the November 3rd election. So I encourage all Californians and really all Americans take extra precautions to make sure their votes count. Vote early to ensure uh, that your vote gets counted. Make sure that you're registered to vote. Make a plan to vote. If you were requesting a mail-in ballot, of course you don't need to do that here in California, uh, make sure it's done early. Uh, if you can do so safely, put on a mask, get some hand sanitizer, and go to the polls yourself. Uh, in addition to uh, my responsibilities on the Committee on House Administration, I chair the House Subcommittee on Immigration and Citizenship, and I know that one of your core values is social justice. Recently, the subcommittee had a hearing about protecting essential, critical immigrant infrastructure workers, and we have been focused on the state of our country's detention centers after horrific reports about shoddy medical care in facilities, as well as reports that appear unfortunately to be true of medical procedures performed on women without their consent. As a matter of fact, the House of Representatives just adopted a resolution uh, condemning that uh, activity on the part of ICE. Uh, unfortunately, 
There's also uncertainty for many young Americans as the current administration has attempted to terminate and severely restrict the protections for DACA, deferred action for childhood arrival uh, recipients from the uh, Obama administration. Lastly, as a member of the Subcommittee on Courts, Intellectual Property, and the Internet, and as a member of the Committee on Science, I'm focused on following sound science, encouraging innovation, and safeguarding Americans' digital rights. I've lived in Silicon Valley my whole life, and I know the internet was founded as a neutral platform to level the playing field for sending and receiving information. I recently spoke at TechCrunch's Disrupt 2020 event, where part of the discussion focused on balancing America's privacy rights without stifling innovation. I don't want to take too much time today, but I want to thank my colleagues, Representative Huffman and Raskin, for forming the Congressional Free Thought Caucus in 2018. I joined because I believe in forming public policy based on reason, on science, and our moral values. I know that mission matters to you, and I again thank you uh, for the honor and for the attention you're bringing to our country's constitutional foundation that keeps us free. Thanks very much. Thank you, Congresswoman, for all of your hard work and representing the people of Santa Clara County. Let's bring some musical talent into this year's event, all the way from Australia. Shelley uses her music to create the world that she wants to see. Her music is filled with feelings of free thought and empowerment, and her debut album, an atheist album, gave her a U.S. audience that led her to perform at the Reason Rally in Washington, D.C. Please welcome, for the first of two exclusive performances for this year's California Free Thought Day, Shelley Segal. Thanks so much for having us, everyone. We're excited to be here uh, for California Free Thought Day. And uh, this is my new song from my new EP, Holy. This is Holy Man. Who is the holy man and what does he believe? That we must cover up our bodies, we must show humility. Well, I believe my body is beautiful and it belongs to me. What makes a holy man? What does he decree? There is an order to this place and he's atop the hierarchy. Well, I believe there's no one above me and no one underneath. But I'm a sinner, I'm a whore, I'm rotten to the core, and you're the holy man. Well, it's you that he confides, you have God on your side, and you're the holy man. Yeah, you're the holy man. Hey, I hear the holy man, he's calling for our souls. That we must kneel back forgiveness like it's something that we oh, oh Well I believe our only stipulation is the kindness that we show But I'm a sinner, I'm a whore, I'm rotten to the core And you're the holy man Well it's you that he confides, you have God and you're the holy man Yeah, you're the holy man Take it away, Rob! Hey! But I I'm a sinner, I'm a whore, I'm rotten to the core, and you're the holy man. Well, it's you that he confides, you have God on your side, 
And you're the holy man Yeah, you're the holy man Said you're the holy man One thing I miss about not being live with all of you is sharing applause for great performances like that. So I'll just add my applause right there. Thank you, Shelley, for giving us such a beautiful song. We'll hear from you again later in our program. It's my honor to introduce our first speaker. Sean Omar Rivera joined the secular movement at 14 when he joined his high school's Secular Student Alliance chapter. He later became the president of the SSA at the University of Texas at San Antonio and a founding member of the SSA National Leadership Council. He's been involved with intersectional activism, campaign organizing, and voter registration, where he helped over 60,000 young people register to vote. Please welcome Sean Rivera. Hello everyone, I'm Sean Rivera. I'm a former SSA chapter leader. I did several years in voter registration work, uh, many of that as a nonprofit field director, and I am currently a city council aide. Uh, I want to thank you for letting me say a few words, and of course I hope you're all staying safe out there. So all of this started in high school. Uh, I just so happened uh, to find an SSA poster for a small group in my high school that formed uh, despite a lot of resistance from the school administration. Uh, it finally gave me a place to feel comfortable with my own beliefs and it gave me an organized outlet uh, to start conversations and uh, potentially change minds, uh, which we did. That led to my eager joining of my university SSA, uh, the University of Texas at San Antonio, uh, and all of the things we accomplished, all of the things that we did uh, to change attitudes in the university really shows that with social organizations, you can work to change attitudes, you can increase awareness of your group and the conditions that you exist in, uh, and even if you don't change the attitude of the whole world, you can at least reshape the community and demonstrate to other communities that change is possible. That work with the SSA really opened my eyes to a lot of other issues, some of them that uh, originally would not have affected me directly. Uh, and that branched out into different forms of intersectional activism and political campaign involvement. Uh, and with campaign work, I got a chance to pin down my personal ideals, determine the policies that embody those ideals, find a person who is almost in a position to enact those policies, and then of course make the final push and get them in the seat so they can do the work. Uh, and, you know, on the same note, we're on a similar subject. Uh, you know, afterwards I spent two and a half years, as mentioned, uh, working with a voter registration nonprofit. And during my time as field director, we were able to register 60,000 young people to vote. Uh, we're down here in Texas. Uh, there are very strict voter registration laws. So all of that was wet signature, by hand, face to face, probably not face-to-face -face anymore, unfortunately, but at the time it was face-to-face. -face. Uh, and, you know, that made a huge change uh, because with the nonpartisan voter registration, voter mobilization that uh, I was allowed to participate in, I didn't have to focus on the candidates and electeds. And uh, I was actually empowered to change the electorate itself. And with your organizing philosophy, you can directly connect people to social goals in a situation like that. Not all people are the same, but if you trust in the inherent goodness of the population that you're targeting, change can happen. You're not contributing to the success of an aspirational candidate, uh, not even flipping a city council seat or even a state house. You're reshaping the foundation, the aggregate that is democracy that aggregate population will shape the face of elected bodies for decades to come, and you're activating them. Uh, depending on the group that you are targeting, in my case, it was young folks, uh, you are activating them for the first time in many of those situations. That not just applies to young people, that applies to people in low socioeconomic uh, situations 
who may have not had the time or the chance to become social or socio-politically involved, uh, and many other folks who are in situations uh, where they've been locked out of the political process and really just need the right information and a direction. And all of that work uh, finally led to one of the best jobs uh, that I have ever had, uh, and that is the privilege of working for a local elected official that I admire and trust. With all of the work that is put in by advocates, marchers, campaigners, and people who do that voter activation work that I mentioned, there's always, of course, still a fear that the community's cries for change are going to fall on deaf ears. In these new circumstances, I have been given the opportunity to actually be those ears. You can get your hands in the work, you can speak with the community, and you can play a direct role in executing policy. On the local level, you can do things like, for example, you can make sure that Mr. Ramirez doesn't break his walker every time he's walking down a shoddy sidewalk. You know, you can do that by working with your team on an infrastructure plan. You can make sure that an LGBT worker doesn't get fired from their job for their sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, and you can do that by working on a non-discrimination ordinance or uh, amending that ordinance to add more groups that need that kind of protection. Uh, from a five-person social club all the way to having a direct role in government, all forms of involvement absolutely play a significant role in change. And that is to say, you know, even if your part isn't in a nonprofit, a campaign, an elected office, that's not important. You know, half of the work and half the contribution is just listening. When people are marching in the streets and telling you that they're suffering, don't confuse closed-mindedness for skepticism. Try your absolute best to push past the internet algorithms, the media angles, and possibly even some of the feelings you might harbor towards some of the people that are doing the talking. If you feel threatened by a movement, if you feel like their criticism of society might be an attack on you, please take a step back and narrow in on the concrete requests that they're making. Is it a difference in values or is it just a difference in semantics? You know, often it's, it's the latter. And sometimes it takes a little bit of legwork to uncover that. And just encourage others to listen. In the end, we don't need to meet in the middle. Uh, at the end of the day, everyone's perception of the middle is dependent on their own experiences and their own perceptions of what constitutes the word extreme. We really just need to start by meeting ourselves where we are. And if that place, whether it be a physical or social place, gives you the opportunity to pull other people up, the place to start is uh, by just acknowledging it and helping others slowly start acknowledging that. You don't have to judge yourself negatively if you're in those roles. You just have to see the opportunity that you have to pull other people up. So in closing, there is a lot of work to be done, of course. There is a huge, huge variety of ways that you can do that work, but if you at least just start there by listening, things could really turn around. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I hope you're all staying safe, and uh, I hope you all have a great day. Life can be hard. Let's thank our gold and silver sponsors one more time, and then I'll tell you how you can get some gifts by supporting our event. Applied Office provides on-site and online Microsoft Office training for you and your employees. Big thanks also to Robert Nicholson and Ken Nahigian. The Reason Center is socially distancing. Check them out on Meetup for online discussions, games, and building a community in Sacramento. And the Black Humanists and Non-Believers of Sacramento can also be found on Meetup and would love to have you at their next event. Black Nonbelievers is a nationwide organization that provides secular fellowship to blacks and allies walking by sight, not faith. 
The Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers provides a community for active duty and veteran atheists, humanists, and other non-theists in the military. Next weekend, be sure to catch the co-founder of the Satanic Temple, Lucian Graves, during Sunday Assembly East Bay's live streaming event on October 18. Learn more on their meetup page. For the unchurched Sacramento area citizens, Atheists and Other Freethinkers is a freethought oasis, a comfort zone, and a community of mind. California Free Thought Day wouldn't exist were it not for its sponsors and donors. It's not too late to become a donor, and if you do, we'll mail you a few thank you gifts. Make your tax-deductible donation today at freethoughtday.org, and we'll mail you your gifts this week. Thank you, Sean, and thank you to our sponsors. Every year at the Capitol, we dedicate a part of our program to authors and podcasters, who are writing and talking about science, social justice, secular rights, and more. This year, we have three such people to introduce. Seth Andrews is a video producer and former Christian broadcaster, but he's best known to all of you as the host of The Thinking Atheist. He's also the author of many books, including Sacred Cows and Confessions of a Former Fox News Christian. Thomas Westbrook is a former evangelical missionary from the Soviet Union, who's now a science-loving skeptic that founded the Holy Kool-Aid channel on YouTube to teach critical thinking and to counter pseudoscience. And finally, Aaron Lewis returns to our event after writing Expose Yourself, a self-help book that promotes critical thinking and self-confidence while interjecting stories from her own life as a stripper. Let's start with Seth. Thank you so much for the privilege and the honor of speaking today. I just published a new book that I'm going to shamelessly shill for here. It's called Confessions of a Former Fox News Christian. And I used to be that guy. I was a Ronald Reagan conservative. I was a Fox News watching, Rush Limbaugh listening conservative. You know, I read Ann Coulter and and enjoyed Michael Savage and Glenn Beck. And I was part of this culture that we're seeing really rise up today. This culture that believes that the United States belongs to a specific party and religion. The party and religion have really become married. We're seeing the infection of sort of theocratic thinking in the Christian right and certainly the modern day Republican party. This started back in the eighties with the people like Jerry Falwell and the moral majority who had infected the political system, had access to the white house, Billy Graham, the famous evangelist. We've seen the influence of the family research council. We've seen the religious tones and the messages, the propaganda really that have been offered up by organizations like the NRA, the national rifle association. So a state church separated government is now essentially under attack by theocrats who want to make it one nation under God, their specific God with a proper name. And they have become desperate and in many ways have completely betrayed the law and the constitution, basic decency to try to hold on to and fortify their power. And as we approach the November election, I am interested in this culture, this culture that has essentially othered everybody else. And this is an effective way to rally people like the uh, Christian nationalist. What you do is, is that you say, well, the Democrats and the liberals and the non-Christians, the seculars, the atheists, etc., they're not simply good people who have a philosophical disagreement on things like right to die issues and LGBT marriage and the death penalty and the legalization of drugs and social programs and immigration, etc. Now, these aren't just people who disagree. They are in league with Lucifer. They are part of a satanic cabal. And we see this with QAnon conspiracies that have taken off and just caught like wildfire on the internet, right? There is a satanic cult that is behind the entire Democratic Party, and they are coming for you. They are coming for your children. They're coming for your religious liberties. They're coming for your speech. They hate everything that is moral and wonderful and good. You know, they hate Christmas. 
and they hate Jesus, and they hate truth, and they hate God, and they certainly hate this country. And how could you ever support somebody who hates this country? And this is useful because I think it explains part of why these evangelicals who ostensibly embrace the best teachings of Jesus Christ, honor and truth and charity and goodness and meekness and humility and turning the other cheek and not being vengeful, etc., right? They apparently hold to those teachings, but embrace in Donald Trump the antithesis of those teachings. Many people look around and say, how does this happen? How did this culture embrace somebody who is the antithesis of the best teachings of their own faith. And I think it's because they have othered the Democrats to the point where no matter what liberals do, no matter what they do, they are in league with the devil, they hate their country, and they hate all that is good. And by othering them in this way, it allows them to hold the position that no matter how awful their guy is, their champion, no matter how flawed he is, no matter how many times he tells a lie or breaks the law or betrays the Constitution and, you know, the vision of the Founding Fathers, no matter how often he incites, no matter how bad it is, at least he's not part of the satanic Illuminati-esque cabal that is trying to infect the world and take over and sort of instigate the apocalypse. This is much of the thinking that is taking place. And, and this is a hugely complex issue. I wrote in my book about these brain studies that have been done that have actually measured people's brains when it comes to political opinions and their value system. Now, certainly there are exceptions to these trends, but neurologists and psychologists have observed that people who lean more conservative politically, not just in the U.S., but around the world, they tend to be more reactive to fearful stimuli. And, uh, you know, they're more prone to routine. They like kind of a safer life. They don't travel quite as much as liberals do. They are more nervous about other customs and cultures. In many cases, they're even more germaphobic, right? So you can see in that context why something like Trump's border wall is so appealing to them. Because if you are afraid of the outsider, you tend to fortify to the inside and you build up those walls. And I think this message has been effectively weaponized by the modern day Republican Party and certainly by Donald Trump. And here we are on the eve of the election. Votes have never been more important. I know it sounds like hyperbole because it, every election cycle has that. Your vote has never mattered more. But we are seeing a constitutional crisis unlike anything we have seen, at least in our lifetimes. I think we're seeing a moral crisis which demands our activism, which demands that we stand up and speak to our values and preserve the right in this country to be able to practice a private faith or not practice any faith and not be othered by a specific political party that has claimed an ownership of this country. The United States is not and was never meant to be a theocracy. It is a representative government, and we need to make our voices heard by voting and by standing forward for what is right, for what is true, for what is legal, what is moral. And that's my encouragement to you. Thank you so very much. I rely on my brain to make a living, but my brain is broken. I, I don't mean mental illness, and it's not that I think I'm dumber than the average person, but I suffer from the rare unfortunate condition in our universe called being human. Th this brain does exactly what it was evolved to do, and for a sophisticated ape, I guess it's not half bad at keeping us alive and helping us get through the day, but it's still broken. Even if you have perfect vision and you're able to see things in 2020, which most people don't, we still intake information through our eyes that is visually perceived upside down and then your brain flips it. On top of that, there's a blind spot in the back of your eyes where the brain and the eyeballs are connected through the optic nerve. Your brain sees that blind spot and it just guesses and fills in the information with what it thinks should be there. On top of that, there's a very narrow sliver of the visible spectrum that we're actually able to see. 
we're not able to, to, we call it the visible spectrum because there's a whole range outside of it that's invisible to us of infrared and ultraviolet. And the same goes for audio. There's only certain frequencies that we can actually hear with our ears and it gets worse as we age. On top of that, we can all be tricked by optical illusions and auditory illusions. We can fall prey to hallucinations. And I'm not just talking about if you're on drugs or if you're mentally ill or if you are temporarily sick. Even something as common and mundane and ordinary as sleep deprivation can lead to hallucinations, even in group situations like Navy SEALs during Hell Week. These are battle-hardened people who can still have hallucinatory experiences. On top of that, we can only focus on one stimulus at once. That can lead to tunnel vision and inattention blindness. And once we've taken all that information in using our poor senses, there are memory errors. We think that our memories are so perfect and that they're stored in this pixel perfect way like a video camera, but they're not. Instead, we remember patterns and shapes and then we taint them with emotions. And it changes every time we recall a memory leading to misremembering, and even in some cases, people have false memories that they genuinely think happened a particular way, but they didn't. And when we go to process all the information that's stored, there's cognitive biases, logical fallacies, and self-delusions, the list of which is a mile long. We react emotionally rather than rationally to things. And this can get us into all kinds of trouble, not just as individuals making it through the day, but as a society, when we make decisions about who we elect, if we make those decisions based off of wrong information and, and then we make decisions about things like climate change or how to handle a global pandemic, if we're making illogical choices or choices based off of misinformation, that's incredibly dangerous. And the scary thing is that no one is immune it affects everyone, even the best and the brightest, even the, the most brilliant scientist is limited by this clump of baloney in between our ears. Fortunately, though, there is a bit of a silver lining. Scientists have developed instruments, experiments, and methods in order to overcome these problems with our physical hardware, our, our meat sacks, taking in things wrong and storing it wrong and then misremembering it. Safeguards like when you want to tell if a drug actually works, you can perform double-blind clinical trials against a placebo. That means that neither the doctor administering the drug nor the patient receiving it knows if they're getting the drug or the sugar pill. And then that way, it's, it's not, it, it, we don't fall prey to the psychological problems that, that happen with us thinking that we're receiving a drug and having a psychosomatic response. There are large sample sizes that are required for clinical trials. That means that you have this big random group so that if there's any statistical anomalies, you're able to, to overcome that. And on top of that, a study has to be replicable because if you perform it once and it works, but then you perform it again and it doesn't, maybe you made a mistake. Replicability helps to overcome some of those inherent problems. And once your study is complete, you have to submit it to respected scientific journals for peer review by anonymous critics who will go through your results with a fine tooth comb looking for any problems to tear it apart and critique it harshly. But when you do overthrow some long held beliefs in science, then you're rewarded for it. There's a mechanism in place to reward people for constantly finding out if something is true or if it's not, but your results must be demonstrated. You can't just throw out speculation, revelation, or something that came to you through the power of prayer. You have to demonstrate your results. Science isn't a dogmatic collection of facts and information. It's a methodology. It's not perfect, but it's self-correcting and improving. And it's the best we have. Without it, we make ourselves vulnerable prey, unable to tell medicine from snake oil, unable to tell superstition from reality or fact from fiction. Hello, I'm Erin Lewis and welcome to Free Thought Day 2020. You might remember me from last year's Free Thought Day 
as the author of Expose Yourself, How to Take Risks, Question Everything, and Find Yourself, Humor and Insights from My Life as a Stripper. Now, as a stripper, there have been many points in my life where I have felt like I wasn't listened to and that maybe I wasn't taken seriously. Uh, it actually happens more often than not. And one of the best ways I have found to make sure that my voice is heard without taking my clothes off has been to take advantage of the privilege and the right that I have as an American to vote. And I can't say that I have always been the most engaged voter. I have always tried to make sure that I vote since I've been eligible at 18, but I haven't always taken a look at all the issues and maybe researched as much as I do now. After spending 20 years as an exotic dancer, I had the opportunity to meet many, many people from different states and different countries. And I have learned to take a different perspective on government and the laws that affect us and our representation in government. And I find it even more important now to make sure that I vote and to make sure that I know who and what I'm voting for. And I have noticed over the last few years that some people will tell you that your vote doesn't matter because of the state you live in, um, because of the demographic, your particular district. But apathy and cynicism is one of the best ways to suppress the vote and to not let your opinion be heard. The only way and the best way to make sure that nobody knows what you're thinking is to stay home and to not vote. So please this year, when you're thinking about it and you're, and you're listening to people saying that everything's terrible and it doesn't matter, remember that your voice matters, my voice matters, and it is even more important than ever to make sure that we make our voices heard. So please make sure you vote. And hopefully next year we will have a chance to be together and shake hands and bump elbows. And if you're interested in learning any more about me or my books, you can follow me on Twitter and Facebook and my website at erinlewis.com. You can find information about this book as well as the other two nonfiction books. And I have started to dip my toe into some fiction. And if you follow me, you can hear more about that also. So have a great rest of your day and thank you for joining us at Free Thought Day. Speaking of writing, we're very proud to recognize two young writers today at California Free Thought Day. To tell you more about our $1,000 scholarship, please welcome, from our scholarship committee, Angela Garvey. Thank you, Kevin. We made the decision years ago to include an annual scholarship essay as part of our event, and it's funded by your donations. This year, our essay prompt was to challenge high school students about the cornerstone of our democracy, voting. We asked students to tell us what they feel has had the most impact on voting, either positive or negative, and what they would change to improve our elections. Out of over 50 applicants, here's the winning essay and the winner of our $1,000 scholarship. The air's warm fuzz wanes, a new work quarter begins, and children bustle back to schoolyards to commence a new year. Every four years, the buzz of a presidential election follows this renewal. Nominations, anticipated debates, and partisan rhetoric roam over the forefront of our media outlets and communal consciousness. But for two consecutive elections, Americans have been forced to use our right to engage in a democracy to instead participate in a catch-22 trust fall, the fallacy of choosing between the lesser of two evils. Americans have become politically demoralized, and that's why we're not voting. This recent phenomenon has damaged the American psyche and altered the way that voters approach and engage with politics. Political demoralization can be attributed to political polarization and the distrust of democratic integrity. Voters are bombarded with polarizing rhetoric in the media, seeing one-sided discourse and unnuanced analyses of presidential nominees and their ethics. This polarity makes it difficult for voters to align themselves with a candidate that they believe in out of fear of being ostracized or deemed morally repugnant for whom they support. Presidential nominees have become valued as partisan figureheads, 
at the expense of true collective exploration into their policies and politics. Americans are left to watch the spectacle of preliminary debates and national conventions, feeling helpless about the election because neither candidate boasts effective policies that will demonstrably improve the state of our nation. Similarly, voters have lost trust in democratic integrity. Recent disputes about mail-in ballots have delineated the fragility of democratic trustworthiness and claims of foreign entities planning to interfere in the 2020 election as they allegedly did in the 2016 election have only increased public distrust of the electoral process. Voters have started to think that their votes do not matter because gerrymandering can overturn the results of the election despite their participation. The dishonest reputations of presidential nominees does not mitigate this issue either. For the past two election cycles, both presidential nominees have been accused of engaging in criminal activity. Public distrust of presidential nominees has made it difficult for voters to make confident decisions about whom to vote for. Even voters who are not swayed by anti-voting advocacy have become paralyzed by the apparent lack of a good option and would rather not vote at all than vote for a candidate who they do not trust. Returning the integrity to our electoral process is the only remedy for America's endemic lack of public engagement in voting. We can do this by treating the next election as a matter of pure politics and encouraging voters to blur the lines of partisanship to vote for whichever candidate's policies most appeal to them. We can also increase the transparency of our electoral system for voters to regain trust in our democracy. In this way, we can eliminate the factors that contribute to political demoralization and our next election will hold true to our nation's democratic values of liberty, equality, and self-government. Congratulations to our winner. We'd especially like to thank Robert Nicholson for his generous contribution to our scholarship contest. And speaking of Robert, he organizes another scholarship competition for students of Winters High School in Northern California. We're pleased to present that winning essay for you as well. Moral Without God, Good With God, and Great as a Human by Jackson Davis. God guides morality for many people, and to many, God and morality are one and the same. In fact, a common criticism of people who are non-religious by some religious people is that it is impossible to be good without God. So in order to answer this, how does one make good moral choices? Morality can be defined as a guide to human behavioral rights and wrongs. For centuries, morality and human spirituality were one and the same. Through this essay, I examined the historical evidence of my personal observations regarding religion, human behavior, and what motivates humans to act morally. I conclude that the factors that result in humans making the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behavior go far beyond belonging to a religion. So first I have to recognize that religion carries with it the potential for a lot of good. Religious organizations create community for people who share moral values, such as the golden rule do unto others as you would do unto them, or they would do unto you. Religious rituals can help people find meaning and direction in times of sorrow and loss. Religion can also help people to act on improving the world at critical times. However, if we look at history, there are examples where religion has convinced many to cause great harm. Wars have been started in the name of religion. Attacks have been committed by people who identify with religion. People have killed for not believing the same way another believes. Religious extremists justify these actions by claiming they are the only true believers. Therefore, unbelievers, or those who practice another religion, are less than human and deserving of ill treatment. Often humans see those who are different, whether it be race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, culture, language, etc., as less than those who belong to their specific group. This human practice is frequently adopted by religious groups. Religion, on one hand, creates a strong sense of community, but through this, a community often becomes judgmental of others who don't belong. Whether it be excluding members of other races, religions, or killing people of the wrong sexual orientation, putting down women for centuries, or any other region. This is a bad human trait that religion can, can and has justified for many. Famous historical examples include Hitler scapegoating Jewish people, saying they killed Jesus, making them other, paving the way to maniacally justify the murder of six million Jews. The Islamic State made all other religions out to be immoral and worthy of punishment. Burmese radical Buddhists promoted Islamic Rohingya migrants as the other, 
therefore causing violence. Hindu nationalists in India turning a blind eye to, every, to terror attacks against Muslim in their country. Horrific events like these happen across every single human populace, and religion is the perpetrator in all these specific examples. It is clear that morality and God are not the same. Many people, whether identifying with religion or not, are in possession of high moral standards. Nobody is immune to immoral behavior, whether believing in God or not. When examining being good without God, it is crucial to consider philosophical thought. The two main ideas of moral philosophy are deontological ethics and consequentialist ethics. Deontological ethics, endorsed by Immanuel Kant, suggests that our intent for a positive outcome, regardless of the outcome, is what makes us moral, whereas philosophers favoring consequential ethics argue that the result of your actions are what determine whether your choice was moral. I see these as two extremes. If we truly believe in deontology, then any terrorist is somewhat let off because they believe what they are doing is right. Does that make them moral, when obviously the consequence is wrong? But what if, but if we believe fully in consequentialism, then for example, a good world person trying to save children from poverty, donating to a fake charity that is actually set up to fund money to a violent drug cartel, would be immoral, despite believing he is doing the right thing. In this case, the consequence was very immoral, but the person had a good intention. Somewhere in the middle of action and consequence is where we find what it means to be good. The golden rule is somewhere in this middle ground. Yes, it is somewhat of an overused statement, but, but it is a simple and powerful example of what it means to be moral. When following the golden rule, people truly treat others with respect and their actions reflect that of what they would want for themselves. This means that theoretically both the consequences of what happens to every person and the actions taken would be moral. If we were to follow the golden rule, one would not be sacrificed in any way for the other. Humanist thought aligns with the golden rule as well. Humanism promotes the use of science to help all humanity. This is a valorous statement. Often in the past, religion has constricted thought. This construct of questioning is one of the things that has plagued religion in the past. Humanism encourage, er, encourages everyone to think and find a way to improve lives. Humanism also encourages the golden rule, as following this rule is in the best interest of the entire human populace. In my personal life, my grandfather is a humanist, and he has done lots of great things in his profession as, as a small-town doctor. He followed his heart and endeavored to help all people. He was not motivated by religious tradition, but rather a desire to do the right thing. In contrast, my great-grandfather, another great person, was a Christian minister. Following his religious beliefs led him to challenge bigotry. He married gay people in the 60s and marched with Martin Luther King. He believed that God called him to stand with the oppressed, to love his neighbor, and to follow the scriptural call to let justice flow like a mighty river. Following his heart and his belief in God led him to make moral choices. These are two great examples of people who are good without God and good with God. Both men listen to the small still voice within. It is clear that mor morality and God are not the same. Many people, whether identifying with religion or not, are in possession of high moral standards. Nobody is immune to immoral behavior, whether believing in God or not. When making a decision and thinking of morality, I listen to the small still voice within, and think about the golden rule, do unto others as you would do unto them, and lead with kindness, as Bruni Muhammad said, don't wait for people to be kind, show them how. These three steps find, guide me in finding my morality. Life can be hard, things can get rough. Stay on your guard. Applied Office provides on-site and online Microsoft Office training for you and your employees. Big thanks also to Robert Nicholson and Ken Nahigian. The Reason Center is socially distancing. Check them out on Meetup for online discussions, games, and building a community in Sacramento. And the Black Humanists and Non-Believers of Sacramento can also be found on Meetup and would love to have you at their next event. Black Nonbelievers is a nationwide organization that provides secular fellowship to blacks and allies walking by sight, not faith. The Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers provides a community for active duty and veteran atheists, humanists, and other non-theists in the military. Next weekend, be sure to catch the co-founder of the Satanic Temple, Lucian Graves, during Sunday Assembly East Bay's live streaming event on October 18. Learn more on their meetup page.
For the unchurched Sacramento area citizens, Atheists and Other Freethinkers is a free thought oasis, a comfort zone, and a community of mind. The Humanist Association of the Greater Sacramento Area is the Sacramento chapter of the American Humanist Association. Thank you, Angela, Robert, and especially to those winning students and everyone who entered the contests. Remember, you can support this scholarship by donating to California Freethought Day via our website at freethoughtday.org. Dr. Juam Navarro Rivera is next in our lineup. He is the political director and managing partner at Socioanalytica Research and a leading scholar in the study of secularism, race, and politics in the United States and Latin America. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Navarro Rivera. Greetings. I am Dr. Juan Navarro Rivera, and I wear many hats in my life. I'm the managing partner and director of political research at Socioanalytica Research a progressive research and analysis consulting firm, the co-chair of the Latinx Humanist Alliance, board member of the American Humanist Association, and senior fellow at the Institute for Humanist Studies. For over a decade, I have studied the demographics and the politics of the rising number of non-religious Americans, or as I call them, secular Americans. Today, and keeping with this year's conference theme of political participation, I want to use my time to dispel two of the myths about secular Americans. That secular people don't vote and that they are not active in politics. I will show you evidence from two national surveys that prove that secular Americans are as engaged and in some cases more active than most Americans in politics. I will show evidence that these myths are just that. Turnout among secular Americans is similar to that of the overall population. Meanwhile, Secular people are as likely as other Americans to engage in various political activities, such as protesting, marching, registering voters. I hope with this speech to dispel these myths and show that secular people belong to a vibrant and politically active community, a community that is very young, but that has the potential to transform American politics. First, let's talk about voter turnout. For years, we have been told that secular people do not vote, that truism generally comes from a misguided understanding of the relationship between population numbers and exit polls. For example, in the last presidential election, secular people accounted for 24% of the population, but just 15% of exit poll respondents. This means that using these numbers, secular voter turnout was an abysmal 34%, much lower than the already low 55% for the general population. The 2016 Cooperative Congressional Electoral Study a survey of more than 60,000 Americans done by political scientists from over 30 universities is a better source for understanding secular turnout. The survey was asked before and after the election and includes questions about voter preferences. The survey also has measures to validate if people voted in the election. My analysis of the survey shows that secular people voted at that 51% turnout, just a bit lower than the 55 general population turnout but much higher than the 34% attributed using exit polls. The difference between the overall turnout and the secular turnout can be attributed to the youth of secular Americans. 22% of secular voters were under the age of 30, just 15% of the population was under the age of 30 in 2016. The second myth is that secular Americans are not politically engaged. But evidence from the 2020 Secular Voices Survey, a new nationally representative poll of more than 2,000 Americans, including 600 secular respondents released by my firm, Socioanalytica Research, earlier this week, shows that that is not the case. We ask people about their participation in various political activities, including attending a protest, meeting, or demonstration, taking part in a neighborhood march, signing a petition in support of something or against something, talking to family or friends about politics, volunteering for a voter registration drive, giving people a right to the polls on election day, giving money to a political candidate or to a political organization, volunteering for a candidate's campaign, contacting an elected official or attending a town hall meeting. We found that in general, secular Americans are as likely to report civic and political engagement as other Americans. 
And this is very important to point out because for years, one of the stereotypes about the secular community is that it is comprised of people who do not engage politically. The Secular Voices survey shows that secular political engagement is similar to that of the overall population. In, on four activities, secular people and, and Americans participate at similar rates. Protesting, marching, signing petitions, and talking to family and friends about politics. The differences in the other seven activities in which secular people are less likely to report participation, that slightly lower participation can be attributed to age. Secular Americans are substantially younger. 31% of all secular Americans are under the age of 30, while about a fifth of Americans are younger than 30. The seven activities are electoral in nature and makes sense that secular people being younger have less experience doing campaign work, such as giving people rights to polling places, volunteering for candidates, or even giving money to candidates and organizations, and attending town hall meetings or contacting elected officials. If we remove this youngest cohort of 18 to 29 years old from the analysis, these differences essentially disappear. One of the things that we did in the Secular Voices survey and that makes it stand out from other surveys is that we asked the subsample of respondents who identify as secular about their participation in secular movement organizations, such as the American Atheist, the American Humanist Association, the Center for Inquiry, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, the Secular Coalition of America, the Secular Student Alliance, or if they have ever participated in a local or online group with a membership consisting primarily of non-religious folk. 26% of secular people report that they have, at some point, been members of at least one of these groups. In all measures of political participation, secular people who have been active in the secular movement report higher levels of activity than the general population. These results show that secular people are active members of their communities and that the people involved in the secular movement organizations are amongst the most engaged and energetic activists in the country today. If secular people are underrepresented in government and elective office, it is not because they are apathetic bystanders. It is because our political culture has created a hostile environment for people who are not religious, particularly atheists. While secular people are slowly making progress, increasing their political representation, I hope that these results give you hope and motivation to continue engaging and inviting other secular people to join you. If you want to learn more about Socioanalytica research and our studies, please visit socioanalytica.com or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram with the username Socioanalytica. To learn more about the Secular Voices Survey, please visit secularvoicessurvey.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at JuMNR, that's J-U-H-E-M-N-R. You can also read my election season column, Non-Decision 2020, at TheHumanist.com. Thank you for listening, and thanks to the Free Thought Day organizers for the invitation. Remember to vote and stay engaged. Democracy will thank you. Thank you, Juem. One of the best parts of having this event in person is seeing kids having a blast on the Capitol lawn every year. We can't do that this year, but we can bring back a cherished performer from Free Thought Day, Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam here, everybody. Great to be back. I want you to vote. That's right. Hey, I brought a couple of my toys here. We're going to have a little fun. Let's open up with a little club juggling. Here's a big move coming up, folks. Oh, I usually get a lot of applause when I do this, folks. You're not impressed. Let's try a little bit higher here. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. That's the applause move right there. I call this the helicopter spin as a person comes around. Oh, we all make mistakes. That's why we have elections, folks. Make sure you vote. Okay, okay, the big move right on my chin now, up, oh. whoa, yeah, we did it, Uncle Sam. Thank you, Uncle Sam. We hope you're enjoying this year's California Free Thought Day. Remember that your contributions make today and future years possible. Just as Uncle Sam is a long-standing part of California Free Thought Day, 
So is recognizing the organizations and volunteers that make our community better. This year, we're recognizing two outstanding individuals, both for their dedicated commitment to building communities for the non-religious. This year's community awards go to Evan Clark and Arlene Rios. Evan's work has been inspirational and untiring. For starting a chapter of the Secular Student Alliance on his campus at Cal Lutheran, and later becoming the board chair of the Nationwide Secular Student Alliance, for hosting an outstanding podcast, for co-founding the Humanist Community of Ventura County, and now for serving as the Executive Director of Atheists United, we're proud to give you our community award. And Arlene, who founded the Fresno Latino Atheists, helping normalize non-religion despite centuries of tradition from Mexican and Latinx homes. And to recognize her service in the US Navy, we are proud to give you our second community award. Hey everyone, hope you're doing well today. Uh, thank you for joining today's event and thank you to the organizers for organizing it. These are wild times and we need more communal events. So thank you to David and everyone at California Free Thought Day. Uh, on behalf of Atheists United and the Secular Student Alliance, I want to accept this award. And I specifically want to thank a few mentors and heroes that have uh, transformed me into the organizer that I am today. I truly am a product of the people that came before me and the people that continue to inspire me. And so I specifically want to name a few of them. Uh, Bobby Kirkhart, August Brunsman, Daryl Ray, Liz Liddell, Kevin Bowling, uh, Nancy Martin, Ron Millar, Alex DeBronco, and, and especially my business partner, Sarah Blaine, um, have truly been inspirations to me and helped help me think about this work in a productive way and inspire me to grow uh, exponentially. So I just want to thank those people specifically. To end this video, I want to quickly challenge the other organizers on this call. I want, I want to challenge all of you to believe in secular community organizing and in the political potential of the movement we're working on. And I think there's four areas of weakness we radically need to improve to succeed. And I want to challenge you all today to invest in these. Accessibility. We need to be where people are at and we need to make our spaces as accessible as possible to all of those, including and especially those with disabilities. We need to be more intersectional. We need to understand that atheism is not a siloed concept and humanism cannot exist without its political side and recognize there are so many issues that overlap with ours. We need to be organized, especially politically, so that we can have influence in this world and we must be public. We must show the world what our beliefs are, why we organize and inspire others to join us. Thank you again for this award. Thank you to the organizers. And I hope you all have a safe and wonderful last few months of 2020. I'll see you in 2021. Hi, I was out hiking the Ice Age Trail in Wisconsin when I was notified that I was one of the two people selected for the California Free Thought Day Community Award. I am honored and humbled to accept this award. Thank you to the California Free Thought Day Committee for choosing me to represent California's free thought community. Thank you to Mark Boyd and Jennifer Dunbar from the Central Valley Alliance for Atheists and Skeptics. When I moved back to California from being stationed in the East Coast, I'm retired from the Navy. They were the first local group I joined when I finally decided on becoming an out of the closet atheist. I would also like to thank Atheist United Los Angeles, Christine Jones, for giving me the opportunity to create a subgroup within Atheist United, the Secular Latinos of San Gabriel Valley, Evan Clark for coaching me on how to speak to the Los Angeles Times and other media outlets when they became interested in interviewing me and other members of our Atheist Latino group. Shout out to my favorite Facebook group, the Secular Latino Alliance, they are my familia. Thank you to my friends and my family who have encouraged me to be true to myself and my activism. A special thank you to my partner, Louis Campos, who also happens to celebrate a birthday on the day this video will air. Happy birthday, Louis. When I was active duty in the Navy and approaching my time to retire, I thought about what I could do to serve my country out of uniform. Continue to volunteer, of course. We are living in unprecedented times. Now more than ever, it is absolutely necessary that we, be, that we become and remain active in politics. Register to vote. 
go out and vote, not just for the presidential elections, but also for the general and special elections. If you don't vote, other people will decide how you should live your life. Don't let them have the last word. Be active, become involved. There are several ways, door-to-door -door canvassing, write letters, write postcards, phone bank in English or Spanish, or any language you're comfortable with. Well, maybe not cling on, but yes, become involved. And if you are able to run for office, Again, thank you so much, California Free Thought Day, for this award. Thank you. Thank you both, Evan and Arlene. We're nearly done with our program, so I think it's time we bring back the beautiful writing and singing of Shelley Seagal. Shelley, the stage is yours. This next song was released last year on International Women's Day with One Law for All. It's a call for women's rights and resistance around the world. Now is the hour for the woman's voice Around the world for a woman's choice We will not rest until we all are free in our right to live with autonomy we will mourn we will cry for all those who have died we will sing and we will dance this is our resistance we will It's our resistance We were born for this chance This is our resistance Oh, the war, it comes from all sides From governments and family ties we will not fail We hold our mother's plans To be heard In all of our demands We will mourn We will cry for all those Who have died We will sing and we will dance This is our resistance We will learn We will thrive We will fight to survive We were born for this chance this is our resistance. We will mourn, we will cry for all those who have died. We will sing and we will dance. This is our resistance. We will This is our resistance. It's our resistance. We were born for this chance. This is our resistance. You can find the songs we played uh, on my website. And if you'd like to support me, you can listen to me on Spotify or uh, become my patron at patreon.com slash Shelley Siegel. Normally at about this time, we'd bring everyone together for a group photo. That's obviously not going to happen. So instead, what if we all took selfies and shared them at the same time with hashtag free thought day? Come on, that's right. Get out your phones right now and get ready to do it with me. All right. Gotta make sure to fix your hair. Get the angle. All right, got it. And now remember to share it using hashtag free thought day. You can even use a moment right now to do that. You can do Facebook, Instagram. I'm gonna do Twitter. So here we go. And hashtag free thought day. Okay, it's coming up. Free thought day. And tweet. 
So thank you so much. I can't wait to see all of your faces. Now, let's take a minute to recognize the people who made today happen. The California Free Thought Day Planning Committee. Big shout outs to Angela Garvey, Becky Mark, Bill Potts, David Diskin, Eileen Ferber, Kaylee Pontiff, Ken Nahigian, Jamie Snyder Hernandez, Marie Bain, Masha Riki Lawson, Nick Gray, and Tom Eichelman for making this video happen. Every year, the committee selects individuals who have contributed to our core values, but have since passed on to be recognized in our Free Thought Gallery. Please welcome, from the CFD Planning Committee, a few members to introduce this year's inductees. Thank you, Kevin. We're so thrilled to have you as our MC this year. As Kevin said, each year we add new faces to our Free Thought Gallery, started by committee member Tom Eichelman many years ago. Inductees are selected by our committee with input from the entire community from individuals throughout history that have contributed greatly to our core values. Past inductees have included essayist James Baldwin, chemist Marie Curie, physicist Stephen Hawking, actress Katherine Hepburn, pro-choice advocate Anne Gaylor, and local activist Cleo Kosal. We encourage you to visit our website, freethoughtday.org, and learn about all 30 of our past inductees. And be sure to visit us next year so you can see their faces and bios on our Free Thought Gallery. This year, two very powerful women will be joining our gallery. Our first inductee is Nella Larson, the American novelist, nurse, and librarian. Nella published two novels, Quicksand and Passing, in the late 1920s. In Quicksand, one of her characters said while lingering near death, had she not called in her agony on God? And he had not heard. Why? Because she knew now he wasn't there, didn't exist. Life wasn't a miracle. And his great love for people regardless of race. What idiotic nonsense she had allowed herself to believe. How could 10 million black folk credit it when daily before their eyes was enacted its contradiction? Her work showed the lives of many particularly women during the Harlem Renaissance, including conflict between classes within the black community, the LGBTQ, and those of mixed races. Our second inductee is Susan B. Anthony, an activist who was pivotal in the women's suffrage movement. Susan was also a vocal opponent of slavery, having started her work at 17, collecting signatures to end it, and later co-founding the Women's Loyal National League with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and the American Equal Rights Association. 100 years before the end of segregation, Susan introduced resolutions for blacks to be admitted to public schools and for all men and women to be educated together. After being arrested for voting in New York, she and Stanton helped to bring the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. On religion, Susan has often equated her passion as her faith, saying, I pray every single moment of my life, not on my knees, but with my work. My prayer is to lift women to equality with men. Work and worship are one with me. And when speaking of religious people, Susan once said, I distrust those who know so well what God wants them to do because I notice it always coincides with their own desires. Thank you, California Free Thought Day Committee. And big thanks to Susan B. Anthony and Nella Larson. It's been awesome being with all of you for this annual event that I love so much. It's the first time it's been virtual, but it's been a great day all the same. I hope you all had a great time too. Thanks to all our volunteers and presenters who worked so hard to make this entire weekend happen. Thanks to everyone who donated and especially those who supported us today. Thanks to our sponsors this year and in years past. Thank you to Scholarship Impact for helping with our essay contest and everyone who entered. We want to see all of you next year in person for the 20th annual California Free Thought Day, and you can bet that's going to be a huge celebration. So mark your calendars now for the weekend of October 9th to the 10th, 2021. Thanks again for joining us for California Free Thought Day.
One last time, let's thank the sponsors and now the individual donors that made this video possible. Applied Office provides on-site and online Microsoft Office training for you and your employees. Big thanks also to Robert Nicholson and Ken Nahigian. The Reason Center is socially distancing. Check them out on Meetup for online discussions, games, and building a community in Sacramento. And the Black Humanists and Non-Believers of Sacramento can also be found on Meetup and would love to have you at their next event. Black Non-Believers is a nationwide organization that provides secular fellowship to blacks and allies walking by sight, not faith. The Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers provides a community for active duty and veteran atheists, humanists, and other non-theists in the military. Next weekend, be sure to catch the co-founder of the Satanic Temple, Lucian Graves, during Sunday Assembly East Bay's live streaming event on October 18. Learn more on their meetup page. For the unchurched Sacramento area citizens, Atheists and Other Freethinkers is a free thought oasis, a comfort zone, and a community of mind. The Humanist Association of the Greater Sacramento Area is the Sacramento chapter of the American Humanist Association. We'd also like to thank the Atheist Community of San Jose, the American Humanist Association, Sunday Assembly Sacramento, Joe Morrow, Rosalind and Russell Worrell, the Freedom from Religion Foundation's Greater Sacramento Chapter, the Secular Coalition for America, and the Inland Empire Atheists, Agnostics, and Humanists. California Free Thought Day wouldn't exist were it not for its sponsors and donors. It's not too late to become a donor, and if you do, we'll mail you a few thank you gifts. Make your tax-deductible donation today at freethoughtday.org and we'll mail you your gifts this week. A big thanks to the individuals who supported our event, including our advocates and our supporters. Without all of you and our sponsors, there's no way California Free Thought Day would have happened. You don't want to leave Cause it feels like home You're sitting in a house with no floor You can feel the mud seeping in But you just choose to ignore oh.